Leia Healthcare, looking after you always. Proud sponsors of Real Health with Carl Henry. Hello, welcome to Real Health with me, Carl Henry, in association with Leia Healthcare. Folks, on this week's show, you're going to absolutely love it. I'm going to look at how you can achieve your best potential for a healthy lifestyle while in your 40s. I'm 39 and three quarters. I'm heading into my 40s, so I'm particularly interested in all the content that we're going to get from this episode. I'm joined by Dr. Mark Bubbs, naturopathic doctor and performance nutrition lead for Canada Basketball. His brand new book, Peak 40, uses evidence-based strategies to help you reignite your energy and your passion at any age, but especially in your 40s too. Mark uses a non-judgmental approach to explain the effect some food groups and a lack of exercise and sleep can have on your body. Mark, a very big welcome to the show. How are you? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me on. I'm intrigued by the content that you're going to give us, and we have to start and get stuck straight into it. Why the big focus on midlife? Why did you decide to focus there with the book? It's a great question. Well, being in my early 40s, and uh, you know, my first book was a deeper dive into athletic performance, and on the back end of that, a lot of the performance staff and coaches who are you know 40s and 50s were wondering how do we get a, a more simplified roadmap. And it was interesting because as I started looking into it. In our mid-40s, there's something called the U-shaped happiness curve. So Professor David Blanchflower at Dartmouth University went around the world, 135 countries they investigated, and they found this relationship that held true across countries, socioeconomic, income. And unfortunately, the sort of bad news is that at 41 to about 48 is this sort of low period when we talk about happiness. And so that idea of our mindset being impacted... um, is a really good starting point because we know that, you know, if we're lacking sleep with kids at home, work's busy, we might be taking care of, you know, older, older aging parents. And so there's a lot going on and that makes it so that, yeah, it's a little bit more challenging and that's maybe why we're holding on to a bit more weight or the aches and pains start to, to act up a little bit. And, you know, I suppose one of the key things presumably for any age in terms of health, but especially in your forties when things are so busy, work, kids, all the rest of it is starting with a plan and putting a plan of action in place. Yeah, I mean, I think the big thing is that we get uh, we start to think that we need an hour for exercise or we need to wait until we have this wonderful stretch of time where we can just layer in this lovely plan that will fit so well into our into our lifestyle. And that's, you know, midlife's chaotic. It's busy. It's frenetic. We're lacking sleep. And so we need to just take things step by step, you know, layer in one habit. You know, with a lot of clients, we start with breakfast. Let's just adjust this breakfast in the morning, make it more suitable it is the meal of the day that we get the least amount of protein. So that's a pretty good place to start. And then if we can cut out things like the mindless snacking in between breakfast and lunch, which is typically just, you know, boredom, or if we've chosen the wrong breakfast, we get this surge of energy to start the day. And then by mid morning, you know, you're struggling at your desk and reaching for, you know, more sugar, more coffee, these types of things. And so, you know, simplifying things, stacking some of these habits on each other, you know, as the weeks go, as the months go is really the key here, and the interesting thing is working in, in you know, elite performance, helping Olympians in this last Tokyo 2021, you know, this is what the best in the world do, right? They're not trying some exotic new diet or, or exercise regime. They're, they're consistent with their efforts, and they, they put, it, put in the work, a little bit of work every day, right? Um, okay, so it's important to say to people, you know, there is no magic just 40s plan. The tips that we're going to talk about apply to pretty much any stage of life, presumably. But in our 40s with the happiness dip and the happiness curve, we've come across that before. We interviewed James Clear before and uh, from Atomic Habits, and he was, you know, he dropped it into the conversation as well. And, you know, Ethan Cross, another, um, another guest that we had on, again, they bring it up. So it is a constant theme that that mid 40s lull is where we're at our, our, our most unhappiest. But the reality is that the changes that we need to make in our 40s are very similar to some of the changes that we may make, you know, in other decades of our lives as well. And we'll start with the breakfast one. Let's chat through that a little bit more. So for people having breakfast, what should they be having? Well, it's a fascinating area because obviously intermittent fasting is really popular. We have all these different versions. And there's a terrific group out of Bath University that do all sorts of research just on breakfast. And this is where context becomes pretty important because they've got some some studies showing that You know, if you're a lean individual and you skip breakfast, you know, you do enhance enhance fat burning and there could be some positive benefits uh, on that side of things. However, if you're holding on to more weight, those who skip breakfast actually have this pronounced blood sugar response. Um, You know, inflammatory levels were higher and something called the second meal effect, which basically meant that after your lunch, you actually also got this big blood sugar bump. So it does really depend on the context. And so... For simplicity's sake, it's good to get back to what our, you know, 
parents or grandparents used to do, which is this idea of three square meals. Because even when we do that, we still get a lot of the benefits of fasting. Um, and of course, we can help in terms of those, keeping those energy levels nice and steady because we get this regular feeding that's going in. So, you know, breakfast, let's get the protein intake up. You know, eggs are a tremendous uh, source of protein. That yellow bit of the egg, right? The yolk is where all the nutrients are, nature's greatest multivitamin. And so, you know, we typically try to get to three eggs, you know, is 18 grams of protein. That might seem like a lot maybe for some people. So if you're doing two eggs, you might want to think about adding, you know, some smoked salmon, some prosciutto, whatnot. Uh, if you're plant-based, you can always go with, you know, a tofu scramble. And then a quick and easy way for clients who are really just out the door, they don't have a lot of time, can be something as simple as yogurt, right? Plain yogurt, throw some berries on there, loads of fiber, antioxidants. Um, and then if you want some nuts and seeds, you know, it's a five minute breakfast, off you go. And now you've got the right fuel on board to kind of help you get through that, that morning, that busy morning. Okay, so when you're having your breakfast, obviously map out in terms of protein content, get some protein in there, as opposed to just your cereal-based breakfast. Aim to get some protein in, so your nuts, your seeds, protein shake potentially if you need to, or obviously, you know, you're looking at your eggs, your meats and stuff like that. But that protein is really, really important because, you know, it makes you feel fuller over the course of the day. It's Yeah, absolutely. And they also there's a really important, uh, you know, we talk about some of these minimum thresholds to hit, and one of them is this protein intake through the day. And 1.2 grams of protein, per kilogram body weight per day is really our minimum goal that we want to be aiming for. And the reason for that is that we see that strongly tied to longevity. So it helps to protect muscle and bone as we age. And there's some phenomenal researchers in Canada, Prof. Stu Phillips, and over here in the UK, Theo Espoglu leads Beckett, that are trying to petition the governments to increase the RDA to this 1.2 grams per kilogram because it has such profound impacts. And so a, a great place for people to start thinking when they're ha making out their meals is first you know, where's my protein? And then from there, you can build out the other, you know, the vegetables, the starches, and, you know, an easy heuristic or simple rule with the starches is, you know, the leaner you are, or the more active you are, then yeah, the more starch we can add in that diet. You think of the Tour de France riders who are consuming, you know, a 1000 grams of carbohydrates a day, whereas the typical person might have a couple hundred. Um, so it all depends on that activity level and health level. And we then talk about, you know, the fuel we want to put on the carbohydrate side of things. And of course, in terms of protein, you mentioned it there, it's maintaining lean muscle mass, which over the course of our 40s, unless we, you know, counteract that with eating enough protein and doing some kind of body weight training or weight training, you know, lifting something, you will lose muscle tissue, which accelerates the rate at which we age and puts us at a, at a higher risk of age related, you know, disorders. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, osteosarcopenia is a big problem. So, you know, as we losing muscle as we age is not a good thing because our immune system, when we get sick, right, the amino acids we're taking from the muscle to be able to fuel the immune system. And so it is important to do some, you know, resistance training to your point, whether it's, you know, body weight, um, carrying the groceries home from the, from the grocery store, these types of things to be able to stimulate that muscle mass, because it's amazing how fast we can lose muscle. Like if you've, if you've ever been sick on holiday, you know, maybe the digestive issue, all of a sudden, you know, you can lose quite a bit of muscle in a short amount of time. But, you know, yeah, an amazing rate of building muscle is only a quarter of a pound a month, maybe half a pound a month. And so this is back to the idea, let's be consistent with our efforts. You know, the minimum effective dose for, for building muscle is 10 sets per body part per week, which basically means, you know, five sets of squats one day, five sets of deadlifts or lunges on another day. And now these are the kind of things where we know we don't have a lot of time in the busyness of midlife. So let's find 10 minutes, 20 minutes blocks to be able to get some of this movement in and to let people know that this actually will produce an adaptation, right? Everybody, unfortunately, kind of thinks you need that hour in the gym or you need to have those long stretches. You know, we don't. We can find these exercise snacks, if you will, these little parts in the day. And if you've got kids at home and you're you know, caring for little ones, that's a lot of times all you can really find anyway, right? Folks, you're listening to Real Health with me, Carl Henry, in association with Leia Healthcare. Yeah, like, you know, it, it's about getting small nuggets of movement in as much as you can over the course of the day. Absolutely. One of the things you mentioned in the book is about owning your night. Tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, so this idea, if you can get your, if you can start the day well and then prevent things from going off the rails too much at the end of the day, which has obviously been challenging for all of us in COVID, right? It's turned into a you know, red wine and dessert whilst watching Netflix every day in a row for a year and a half. Um, 
And unfortunately, we have seen weight gain over this COVID period. And the more troubling thing is, in general, we're eating later around the world. So after 6 p.m., over 40% of our caloric intake is coming in. This is in Europe, America, even places like Japan, which typically have you know, the longest living people. And so the later we eat, you know, we tend to eat more packaged and processed things and desserts or alcohol. And these things don't just add calories at the end of the day, leading to weight gain. They also interfere with our sleep. So something like alcohol interferes with your REM sleep, which is that period where you really synthesize all the things you learned in a day. And of course, you're going to wake up and, you know, feeling like you're struggling more and more. And so the big thing with this is that it does become a little bit like Pavlov's dog. If you have that snack at 930 in that same room while you're watching TV, all of a sudden that environment starts to trigger that cue to your brain to want to have that snack again, right? To get that dopamine hit, that reward signal or that serotonin hit, that feel good neurotransmitter from having that, that sort of dessert. And so one of the strategies of trying to prevent yourself from falling into that is just go to a different room, read a book in a different room, go for a walk, do some light stretching, you know, take a hot bath or shower. These are ways to just start to break that association because it is amazing how we do fall into these patterns. And, you know, when they're the patterns that are helpful, it's great with the, whether it's movement in the morning, et cetera, but when it's detrimental, it does become hard to break those loops. Let's stay on sleep for a minute then. So sleep is absolutely crucial. Presumably in your 40s, we're having less of it than we should because of stress, families, life, all of that. So what ways can we improve our sleep? Yeah, midlife is a time when all of a sudden the sleep drops off. And unfortunately, you know, the typical person only gets about six and a half hours a night. Um, this is where there are some parallels to our Olympians because Olympians actually have you know, less sleep and more fragmented sleep than the general population because they're so busy with their training and oftentimes they need to fund themselves. And so they have jobs or multiple jobs. And so despite the fact that over the last decade of sleep research, we've everyone now, we know we should get more sleep, but whether it's the athletes or the rest of us, we still struggle to actually do it. Right. And so, yeah, the minimum we want to aim for is seven hours if we can. And, you know, sleep experts will always tell us that we want to try to anchor our waking time. So as best we can, trying to get up around the same time. And, you know, if you've got little people at home, that's that sort of takes care of itself. Um, but what I would suggest for people to do is that rather than always thinking of your nightly total, because life gets busy and sometimes we can't get seven hours, so let's start thinking about that weekly total. So can we add even a 20-minute nap where you're not actually falling asleep, but you might close your eyes, put some light music on, and that helps to increase alpha brainwave activity right? It's more regenerative and focused. Um, and then on the weekends, if you have more time, settle down for 90 minutes, if you can block it off somehow, and, and that'll help to build your weekly sleep total, which if you think seven hours a night times seven, that's 49 hours a week is our target. Let's see if we can move towards that. Because when we talk about mood, blood sugars, weight loss, testosterone, you know, libido, sleep improves all of those things. And so we do need to just consciously try to carve out, you know, that time to be able to try to hit some of those targets. And do you come across athletes or even people in practice who say, oh, I can't do it. I'm too busy. I'm, I, I, there's too much going on. Life is too whatever. For people listening in who kind of think, you know what, I can't do that. Or I can't have time. I don't have time to make that kind of breakfast or, you know, what do you For say sure. to them? What, what, if, if that situation comes up, which presumably it does. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, it's not time management, it's priority management. And so if something's a priority, people will find a spot in their schedule for it. And so this is where, whether it's a general client, whether it's somebody who's trying to make it to the Olympics, you know, you have that face-to-face -face conversation around, okay, you know, how important is this weight loss to you? Is it just about weight loss or is it the fact that now you'll have more energy to play with your kids? You know, you'll be able to have less pain so you can lift your kids or grandkids or whatever it might be, you know, trying to make it a priority, but also tying it to some of the, the values that the person might have around why they want to have more energy, why they want to lose weight. Because yeah, aesthetics is nice, but there's typically deeper reasons why people want to make these changes. And if we can start to draw a line between those things, all of a sudden, you know, it makes it a little bit easier. And what I often tell people, people are used to putting a lot of effort in and not getting as much reward. And so that's often the, the feedback loop that they've got 
in that unconscious narrative. And so to try to flip that, we give them little things to do to start with. And all of a sudden they feel a lot better or they start losing weight. And now we flip that on its head to say, yeah, let's do a little bit. And then we can get a nice, you know, progression or payout from that. And then all of a sudden it becomes easier to sell that idea of we're going to make some changes to the, to the behaviors, but it is, you know, it's a marathon, not a sprint. And so I think people, um, you know, need to have that mindset as well. And what about people who say, and we come across this in, in Ireland, a huge amount, oh, it's the middle age spread. Can't do anything about it. I'm just getting belly fat. My waistline's increasing. I'm kind of slumping in my chair. And, you know, it's just the middle age spread. Talk to you a little bit about that and around debunking that a little bit. Yeah, well, I mean, it's true that metabolism does slow as we age, but not that much in middle age, right? And I think, again, another nice parallel in, in athletics and in sport, if you overtrain, then the repercussions are things like lower mood, lower metabolism, you know, more inflammation, more pain. And so for the rest of us in midlife, it's not from exercising too much, but the life load, right? The work schedule, the lack of sleep, the kids at home, all these things that are going on is a similar stress load to an athlete training intensely. And so that's the reason why we then start to crave more food. So all of a sudden we might not realize it, but we're having more snacks late at night or we're reaching for sugary things in the middle of the day. And that's a natural response to being busy or under stress or running on adrenaline all the time. And so, you know, I think the biggest thing in midlife, we sort of don't realize how we, these little bad habits sneak in because we're just trying to tread water and keep our head above water. And so it happens gradually over time. The nice thing again, is that we don't, we can gradually start moving it in the other direction with just some small changes, right? Most people are only five or 10 degrees off the solution but because they don't know, they can't see, you know, the roadmap, then we, we do the shotgun approach. We're going to try this diet. Oh, scrap that. I'm going to try this completely different diet. And we just end up turning ourselves in circles where if we just took, if we just did smaller steps and stacked them on, that's when we can really make some progress. The title of the book is The New Science of Midlife Health for Leaner, Stronger Body and a Sharper Mind. Chat me through the relationship between the, the wellness component of a leaner body, you know, stronger body, eating better, sleeping better, and the mental components of it, and the mental wellness components of that. But looking after your body and minding yourself, you'll perform mentally, you'll perform better. Yeah, I think that's a big one where the last year and a half of COVID has really highlighted this for all of us, right? Like we, people's, the steps that you would take in a day have plummeted for all of us, you know, because we're sitting around. Uh, it's wonderful to have things like Zoom, but we're, we're on that all day. And so, you know, mental health is something that's front and center these days. And there are a lot of parallels, right? The less sleep you get, the more difficult it is to disengage from negative thoughts. The higher your blood sugars are, right? The more likely you are to be pre-diabetic or diabetic, right? And your insulin levels, which is your blood sugar hormone, the higher inflammatory levels are in the body. And typically the more weight we're holding on to, inflammation will be higher. That's also strongly associated with things like low mood, depression, and so, yeah, the, the body is all talking to each other, the, the brain, the, the physical body, you know, we separate it out to be able to understand it all, but it's all one system. And so that's the beauty of, of being able to try to get to, you know, we see today seven or 8,000 steps a day is really where you start to see a lot of those benefits up to about 10 or 12,000, right? After that, walk more if you like to, but that's kind of that sweet spot that you can aim for. And that movement helps to move blood and helps with things like mood as well as blood sugar control, blood pressure. And so when we talk about mental health, the movement piece is key. The, the nutrition piece is key. Getting that sufficient sleep is key. And I recently had a conversation with uh, Dr. Drew Ramsey, psychiatrist at Columbia University. And he said that exercise is one of the great solutions for anxiety, right? It's, it's a great way to just raise the playing field if we can actually get out there, sweat, get moving, helps to increase what's called BDNF in the, in the brain. And so, yeah, I think, you know, it's front and center today with, with mental health. And I think we need to then revisit if, if people are struggling on that side, what are we doing from a nutrition, exercise, and lifestyle standpoint? Because we can really improve things by addressing those. Okay, so it all comes back to reflection and you know, looking at your situation, looking at where the issues are, then prioritizing 
looking at your lean proteins, reducing your empty carbohydrates, reducing your late night snacking, movement, little and often, bit of resistance work, a little bit of cardio, looking after your sleep. And that whole kind of combination together will keep us healthier in our 40s and beyond. And they apply pretty much at any age group. We have the name of the book. Remind me, remind me where people can follow you on Instagram or online. Yes, yeah, so if they want more info, they can check out drbubs.com forward slash peak 40. Um, I've got a unique last name. So at Dr. Bubs, you can find me on uh, Twitter or Instagram and I'm pretty active. So feel free to fire away questions. Uh, happy to answer. Amazing. Dr. Mark Bubs, thank you so much for joining us on today's show. Folks, that's it for another episode of Real Health with me, Carl Henry, in association with Leia Healthcare. As ever, you know where we are, realhealthandindependent.ie, at Carl Henry PC on Twitter and on Instagram. And we'll see you next week for more Real Health. So long before. Leia Healthcare, looking after you always. Proud sponsors of Real Health with Carl Henry.